The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, episode 801 for Monday, February 10th, 2020. <laughs> Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where we take questions and tips and cool stuff found from you and from us. And we share them in hopes of answering the questions, learning something from the cool stuff found, learning something from the tips. Really, in fact, the goal is for each and every one of us to learn at least five new things. Yes, that's right. We've kept the number the same for 2025 new things each and every time we get together together. Sponsors for this episode include expressvpn.com slash MGG, mintmobile.com slash MGG, linode.com slash MGG, and mac.cashfly.com. We'll talk about what each of those can do for you in a little while here. But for now, here, uh, at least at this moment in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in rather chilly and maybe snowy uh fearful connecticut this is john f Braun. yeah it's uh it has it has been cold it's like ice and we had actually our power was out for a little while yesterday while they fixed some lines really? yeah it, it, there was actually a huge power outage in fact it was interesting we'll we'll it, we'll get into a little bit of this because it it gets into troubleshooting uh, at about seven, let's say seven thirty on Friday night, there was a big windstorm and lots of ice on the trees. Like it had, it had slushed during the day, like snow and rain and and snow and ice and you know all of that falling from the sky as the temperature sort of went up and down uh, as the precipitation happened, and then uh, it dropped Friday night and there was a lot of ice on the trees, and and then wind came and took trees down, which took power lines down. And, um, and we were not affected directly by that. Our power, other than flickering a little bit, I suppose, uh, maintained, which was fine. And then, but, but sort of the two main arteries to our neighborhood, uh, had some major structural problems. And during the day, uh, the next day, the next afternoon, they turned our power off uh, for the whole neighborhood while they sort of restrung the lines. But it was interesting. We were at a, uh, a uh, hockey game while all of this happened uh, at the university of New Hampshire and the scoreboard went out midway through the game because of this power outage. There was a power outage on campus, but the rest of the power in the building worked and doing some diagnosing and, and talking with people sort of on the inside, I realized what happened was the, uh, the machine the rack that contains the hardware that generates the images that appear on the scoreboard is actually in a building across the street connected by fiber and so either that building lost power and doesn't have a ups or more likely uh some you know fiber switch or something in between those two buildings does not have a ups on it and lost power so while they could and they kept rebooting the scoreboard and you'd see the IP address come up on the you know, huge scoreboard or whatever. Yeah. Um, but we were talking about it and like, OK, well, there's another game tomorrow night. And uh, I bet by, you know, by tomorrow, it, this will no longer be the case that this that this rack is across the street. It'll be in the same building run on the same power. So if this building has power, the scoreboard works because for a hockey game, not having a scoreboard. I mean, it, you know, it's nice to have the the video images, you know, happening up there, but, but the clock really matters in a hockey game, you know, being able to see where the time is, where penalties are, they had to keep announcing things. I mean, they did a fine job sort of working around it, but as I said, I guarantee you by tomorrow, this, you know, this racks over here. And I was talking to somebody in, internal at, at the university and like, well, you know, it's pretty big bureaucracy here. Things move slowly at that may. It, and what he said was that may be impossible and I thought about my time troubleshooting stuff when, when we had computer nerds down in Austin. Uh, we were network support for one of the big TV stations, the CBS station down there. And I learned a lot about the word impossible uh, when it came to troubleshooting. And I really think that a lot of kind of my foundational stuff with, with troubleshooting came from, from, you know, that experience and other things happening at the same time. Because as soon as he said it was impossible, my first thought was, why? 
you know, not not OK, we'll just take it at face value. It's like, why is that impossible? You know, and I also learned that one of the best things to do in a scenario like that is to suggest to start by suggesting some preposterous solution, you know, like, all right, well, let's dig up the street and 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 figure out where the problem is. Now, that's that's I mean, that's pretty extreme, right, to say dig up the street in this scenario, but it will immediately get everyone, including me, engaged in finding a less preposterous solution. And it will very quickly identify and highlight where the the uh, resistance is in any in any process. And it might be bureaucratic resistance. It might be physical resistance. It might be, you know, uh, uh, financial resistance, whatever it is. But it will, as soon as you start, you know, just it, throw everything out the window and recommend something entirely preposterous that you really don't expect anybody will, will sign off on. But sometimes they do, you know, uh, and it, it's a great way to start troubleshooting. And I, I certainly do that with, you know, with my own stuff here. And, and anytime I'm helping you folks or clients uh, still to this day, just start with the preposterous. So that's my uh, that's my starting advice based on a, an ice storm. Start with the preposterous. And, and it'll get you somewhere because, you know, then then maybe it's just, a, you know, if I say, well, let's dig up the street. Somebody might say, well, you know, we could just wheel the rack across the street like we could we could just do that. It's like, oh, oh, OK. So that's not impossible anymore. Right. The suddenly, you know, the crazy guy with the bulldozer makes it seem like everything else is maybe a better, way better idea. Oh, OK. Sounds good. About the absurd. Ba what's that? What, what did you say? Bow to the absurd. Bow to the absurd. I like it. Ah, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, there you go. We do have some quick tips to go through, though, if, if, if that's not too preposterous. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, power's back. Everything's good. It's, uh, it's all fine. I do have some thoughts to share about my own network, but I'll we'll, let's get to some some quick tips and help you folks before I you know turn this into Dave therapy. Uh, all right, <laughs> Everett says I wanted to bring your attention to this specific feature in Safari. Right click on any video and select Enter Picture in Picture. Now this is the real trick. If you're on YouTube or any site that has a replacement menu for the right click, simply right click again and you will get the standard right click video menu and you'll get a floating window of that video in all spaces over all windows. And you can drag it to the corner of the display or in my case, he says, I normally have two displays on my iMac. However, since I just moved, I was not able to bring my large desk. So I'm currently just running off in one display. And it's like, that whole picture in picture thing. So yeah, the trick is right click on a video and you can get into picture in picture in Safari unless the video player in Safari has its own right click menu, then just right click again. So thanks Everett. Good stuff. Very, very cool. I like it. Anything on that before oh, we move on? Ah, oh, yeah. there he is. That's good. Yeah. It's yeah. Pretty good. No, I just, yeah, I did it yeah. twice. Yeah. So first I got the YouTube menu and now enter full screen, enter picture and picture. Look at that. It's nice, huh? Good one. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's, it's good. All right. Cool. Uh, Todd says he's got two quick tips that have to do with Windows. Uh, Windows on the Mac, not the operating system. The actual, you know what? Let me just get to this and then you'll understand what I'm trying to say here. Number one, Todd says, I just learned that if you double click on the edge of a window, that window edge will expand to the edge of your screen option. Double clicking on an edge, that window edge and the opposite window edge will expand to the edge of your screen. Similar with clicking on the corners, except double option. Click on a corner will file. The will fill the screen with that window. So that's a lot to do. It's probably just worth experimenting. Double click option, double click on all edges and corners of a window until you sort of learn how this works. Um, so thank you for that one, Todd. And number two, this is going to be great. He says, I use default folder all day long, but because I use default folder, there's a feature in the finder that I didn't know about. He says, if you have a save dialogue open, you can drag a folder or even a file 
from the finder into that save dialog and the location of the file or folder that you've dragged will the save dialog will jump there. So this is something that us default folder users have been able to do for a long time. In fact, you just when a save dialog is up or an open dialog, you can just, uh, you know, float over the finder and it'll sort of highlight windows in this very sort of intuitive way. And you just click and it, it jumps your your dialog there, which is super handy without default folder. I feel like I'm flying blind in that regard. This solves that problem if I happen to be on a machine that doesn't have default folder. So thank you for that, Todd. Very, very cool. I told you it was about Windows, just not the way I made it sound. So <laughs> thank you, Todd. It's good. Anything more on that one, John, before we uh, move on to Elliot here? Uh, Elliot. Elliot. Elliot shared a great tip. And that tip is that if you option so uh, you can do a recovery install right with command r and then that will install the um version of mac os that you have on your machine it'll 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 let you do a reinstall if you do option command r that recovery install will install the most recent OS version instead of the existing version. So option command R or command option R, if you like to say it that way, installs the most recent Mac OS, not the one that is on your drive. So it would, it would download it over the internet. I presume is, is what that would do. But um, thank you, Elliot. That's super handy advice. So I got to remember to do command option R to do that, that internet. Um, restore so yes yes good stuff right yes john thoughts on that I one think so okay the, you know the the i told you when i set up my machine i didn't do that okay I didn't do that type of install and it, and it it seemed to just doing the regular recovery seemed to install the most current version or it updated it I don't know. Huh. Well, you were probably when I got my machine. Uh, the the thing is, the backup that I restored from right. had a newer version of the OS, and it whined about that. It's like, well, you know, the OS is is newer. Uh, yeah, on so your backup. So you know, I I want to update, and the update failed. But when I did the recovery install, it updated it to the newer version. Maybe it maybe it had flagged that because you were trying to migration assistant from the because I I've run into that before too where it's like oh no you got to mm -hmm. upgrade first and so maybe at that point it just forces internet recovery so um, so maybe that that was it yeah yeah interesting very cool mm -hmm. Andrew says did you know that you can copy from the new fangled screenshot preview just command C. And then you can delete the preview just like an iOS. He says it was for me kind of a dull moment and I wish I'd tried it a couple of years ago. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you, Andrew. I had, I never thought to even try that. I always do the, instead of doing, you know, command shift five or whatever I do command option. My fingers know how to do it. Uh, command control shift to, to automatically send it to the clipboard, which at times is, is what I want, but uh, there is, there are handy things about that new screenshot preview and, uh, that would, I, I gotta remember this. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Good stuff. Of course you can copy from there. This is what quick tips are all about. Quick tips really are the kind of sharing of the duh moments because, <laughs> you know, you know, these things once you know them, once you, especially once your fingers know them, but, um, but if, until you do, like, there's no manual that says, hey, try to copy from here. Or if there is, you know, yeah, there you go. A <laughs> couple more quick tips here. Scott reminds us of one of our favorites, which is that he says, I had a PDF that I had just scanned and realized I needed to print a copy. Uh, I didn't really want to open it just to hit print. And from the desktop, a right click did not give me the option to print the icon. I already had the printer window open since it's a multifunction machine. So I decided to just drag the file icon 
to the window and see what happened. Voila, he says. It simply printed the document, leaving the icon on the desktop, which is exactly what it'll do. Yeah, if you've got that printer window open, you can drag a document to it. Similarly, if you, let's say you accidentally tell your Mac to print to your work printer and you're at home, and now that document is sitting in the queue for your work printer because it's not accessible on your network at home, and waiting to print, you can open up the dialog from the uh, from your you know printer at home and just drag between the two, and that'll do it too. So yeah, handy to be able to do all that stuff. This one that that tip comes up, what you know once every year or two, John, and it's always it's always one one to remember. It's good. Uh, any thoughts about that before we go to, I think it's one from a different Scott and we've got, we've got multiple Scott's represented at least three in this show. <laughs> so, all right. A uh, different Scott <laughs> says, uh, 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 where are we here? Uh, he had a link. There were, Oh, this stinks. Why didn't the PDF that I made keep this? Ah, oh, that sucks. We'll have to come back to this one. All right. Um, but I will share a uh, a tip and we'll and then we'll we'll come back to this quick tip and we'll we'll reprep it so that we have the actual information that Scott was going to share with us. Um for years, and I mean all the way back to the beginnings of Mac OS 10 or OS, I guess Mac OS 10 is what we called it. Every time I go to system preferences and look for something like date and time, for example, or sharing, I am lost. I can like I my brain is pretty pattern oriented. I don't know why I can't seem to remember where on my system preferences screen specific things are. But I do not. I do not remember. And it drives me crazy every time I'm like searching and it's, you know, this disorganized mess and I finally realized the other day that I could in the system preferences, go to the view menu and choose organize alphabetically. And my life has changed because now I can just go there and do it. And you can also search to filter down and find things, which I was doing far more of than I ever wanted. So I figured moving to alphabetically at least puts me where I know where it is. Like some of them, you know, like iCloud and network, my, my fingers know where to go, but for whatever reason, like sharing and date and time and security and privacy keyboard, like, I don't know. I, I just can't find them. So now I can find them because they're alphabetical. So if you're like me and you've been, been sort of fumbling through this for, you know, however many years you've been fumbling through it, try that out. It works well. Good. Yeah, John. Nice. Yeah, I think so. All right. Hey, uh, I want to talk about our first two sponsors, if that's okay with you, Mr. Braun. Dandy. All right. I'm stoked to talk about these next two sponsors because they are sponsors for geeks like us, but they make it easy, which is really great for geeks like us. The first one is ExpressVPN at expressvpn.com slash M G G look, there are tons of VPN providers out there. You've probably heard of a lot of them. You know, we talk about actually a lot of different ones here, but the one that is our favorite is express VPN. We started using them about a year, maybe a year and a half ago when they first came on board as a sponsor. And man, I have been super impressed. It is the VPN that I continue to use. I pay for it for my family. It's Awesome because it's so simple. Now, one click, iOS, Mac OS, and other operating systems too, Windows and Android and all that good stuff. One click gets me connected no matter where I am. If you've used other VPNs, you understand how impressive that is. If you haven't used other VPNs, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Just use ExpressVPN and you too can join this one click and you're connected scenario because what happens is depending on the network you're on getting that secure vpn tunnel in place can kind of be tricky you don't know what ports are going to be available you don't know what services are going to be blocked well express vpn knows how to deal with this it just does it it finds the path that's going to work 
it sets up that connection and boom, you're connected and you stay connected. In fact, you can even set it to make sure that it doesn't allow internet traffic to pass unless you are connected to the VPN, which is huge, right? So if you're on that, you know, kind of shady coffee shop network, ExpressVPN has your back. So to protect yourself with the VPN that we use and trust here at Mac Geek Gab, use our link expressvpn.com slash mgg today and get an extra three months for free on your one-year package that's right expressvpn.com slash mgg one more time with feeling visit expressvpn.com slash mgg to learn more and our thanks to expressvpn for sponsoring this episode our next sponsor is linode listen you're a geek you're gonna need a server someday and Linode knows how to take care of you. They know how to take care of you in terms of the capabilities that you need. And they know how to take care of you on price. And they're going to give you a $20 credit just for being a Mac Geek Gab listener to get you started. We all learned years ago that SSDs were the things that made our computers go from being sluggish to fast. Most of the time we're waiting on a disk. We're not waiting on the CPU. That's mostly true in your servers, too. Certainly sometimes you need gobs of CPU, just like you do on your Macs. But a lot of times you just need fast disk access. Every server at Linode runs on an SSD, solves that problem. Every server is connected to their 40 gigabit network and all of them use industry leading processors. I mentioned a $20 credit and you can get one by going to linode.com slash MGG. That means that their lowest price server, the Nanode, is available to you for free because it's just five bucks a month, $20 credit, five bucks a month. You get four months for free of their Nanode server just by going to linode.com slash MGG. Check it out. And our thanks to Linode for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, I'll move back over here so you can move back over there. Uh, we had a problem this week. Well, it really started two weeks ago with our Mac Geek Gab mailer. You know, the, the thing we send out, we send out, we, as we say, if you visit MacGeekGab.com, you put your email address in, you can get the show notes delivered to your inbox every week. And that's great. That way you have the links for everything we mentioned, for the advertisers, all of that good stuff. Well, as some of you, many of you noticed, uh, you got MacGeekGab 797 in your inbox. You got MacGeekGab 798. And then that was it. And I noticed that too with 7.99, and you know we use Mailchimp, and I thought, okay, well, uh, you know, I looked, I dug into our Mailchimp account, everything looked okay, it was fine, and I figured, well, it's just one of those flukes. Uh, well, 800 will come out. Well, 800 didn't come out, and so then I dug in and I sent a support request to Mailchimp, and it took them a couple of days, and they got to me and they're like, oh, do you folks remember? When we started this, I said, make sure you, you know, you sign up so that you get us to the point where we have to start paying for our MailChimp subscription. Uh, you did that, which is awesome. MailChimp didn't ever tell us that you did that. In fact, even when I logged in, it didn't say, hey, your account's on pause because you have too many subscribers. Now you got to pay. You can't use the forever free, free plan anymore. Nothing. Zilch, the support people figured it out and they're like, oh, you just got to upgrade and then everything will be all right. I'm like, cool. And I gave them our money, you know, for the first month subscription, whatever it was. And then the mailer went out the next morning. But I did ask them that maybe they want to tell people this because it would be a good way for, you know, them to encourage us to spend our money with them. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. That's just crazy. Me. Maybe it's just me, you know, being in business. I, I figured, you know, there's two things I I, I always say. I never really thought about the second one. The, the first one that I always think of John is, is that you need to make it easy for me to give you my money, you know, like that. Don't add any friction, right? That, that I know it seems obvious, but I think we've all experienced things where it's like, all I want to do is pay you. And it, they make people make it difficult. Uh, we, we attempt never to be that with any of our, our, our businesses, <laughs> but evidently there's a second one, which is tell the customer that they should pay you like offer the product. Tell them it's time. I don't know. That seems pretty obvious to me. But anyway, they could the have just said, show me the money. Show me the money. That would have been enough. That would have been enough. Yeah, yeah I know. It's like really all they had to do. And uh, 
Yeah. So they apologized. They're like, yeah, this, we're, I'm sending this to, you know, our, our feature department. I'm like, that's a really good feature to have if you want to stay in business. I'm hoping it gets prioritized. <laughs> but anyway, problem solved. As, as many of you probably noticed, you got one mailer. I think it was on Thursday that had both 800 and 799 in it. Uh, this week, hopefully you'll just get the one that has has 801 because everything's the queue is flushed, as it were. So Scott. I told you there were many Scots. Uh, we have another Scott, this one with a question that really, though, comes with a tip that I did not know. Scott says, I'm not much of a TV watcher. I have a few shows backed up on my DVR, but I can go days without watching anything more than the 11 o'clock news. However, he says, my wife has a new iPhone 8 and I have a new iPad Pro. So between us, we get a free subscription to Apple TV+. Plus." <laughs> Also, he says, I'm an Amazon Prime member, and with all the Amazon hype, my wife would like to watch some of those shows, too. Sure, he says, we can watch on our iDevices, but who wants to hold the phone or tablet when we have a perfectly working HD TV in front of us? The TV, however, he says, does not support streaming. It's a few years old. Besides, if we stream, then we can't do other things like check email. So it doesn't support AirPlays is, is what he's saying or mirroring or anything from the devices, but, which is fine. No problem. So now what? He says, an Apple TV is expensive to buy on top of everything else that we've bought. Cheaper and with good reviews is Roku, and it claims to be able to stream Apple TV Plus and Amazon, and they have a wired model for those of us paranoid against wireless. I thought this would be easy, Scott says, but the more I look into this, the more confused I am. Any words of wisdom? So, as I said, you taught me something new i had I, I had no idea that there was an apple tv uh, app for roku but there totally is it came out in like november which was perhaps one of the busiest times that i've ever had in my life both personally and professionally so i'm just going to blame it on q4 being a um, you know absolute mayhem for me that i missed this news but um but yeah there's a roku app that'll let you play apple tv plus there's also a roku app for uh for Amazon Prime and Netflix and all these other things. Roku is a fantastic streaming box. Uh, we do have Apple TVs in our in our kind of two main viewing areas just because we sort of have them. Uh, but I have a, a Roku TV in the kitchen and it, you know, it's got a Plex app that you can put on it. I mean, there's just there's hundreds of apps for it um, and and. Many people, I don't have enough experience to truly, you know, sort of rank them. Uh, but anybody that I know and trust that does puts Roku well above Apple TV in terms of streaming boxes. Now, if you want to add gaming to that and if AirPlay is important to you, well, then, you know, the Apple TV starts to to take the the nod. But in terms of if you just want a box to stream from, you know, the Roku seems to sit uh, way at the top of the list. So, uh, so there you go. Um, I would, I, for Scott, I would say, get yourself a Roku and, and do that. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, as long as you, and, 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 you know, listening here, hopefully you, you are, as long as you're making the decision eyes wide open, where you know that you're not getting the Apple specific features of say an Apple TV, but, uh, but yeah, you, you can do this stuff. And clearly your eyes are wide open, Scott, because you taught us something, which is even better. So, yeah. What do you think, John? Uh, I got Apple TV. I got TiVo. I don't think Roku is on either one of them. No, Roku is its own platform. So, right, right. Yeah, yeah, no, Ro Roku is, is, is the, the sort of the app store, if you will. I mean, it's more than that. It's, it's the streaming platform, but they have their own app store. So, so you would, you would have Roku say on your TV or you might have, you know, like Scott, you can buy a separate Roku box and then, and then you have access mm -hmm. to all of those apps, including Apple TV plus Plex, uh, Amazon prime, Netflix, Hulu, you know, all the, all the apps for any streaming stuff are available on Roku. In fact, there are more of them available, I think for Roku than, than, our apple tv platform so yeah yeah very very cool uh, kiwi graham yeah. in the, oh go ahead oh no uh, i was gonna say yeah kiwi graham in our chat room which where is our chat room i think it's macgeekab.com slash stream that's correct but he has a question um 
does the Roku allow you to run a VPN? My Apple TV cannot connect to Australian content from the UK. Hmm. And it turns out that, yes, you can run. Um, well, no, you need to install a VPN on your router in order. So Roku, it doesn't seem like there's a way to install a VPN on a Roku box. But you, you, there, are, there are some routers that allow you to install a VPN uh, on the outbound. And so you could do that with um, if, you, if your router supports that. So, yeah, the, but the Roku, you can't install the VPN directly on it that would be that would be quite an app yeah yeah interesting 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 yeah that would be that would be handy i'm sure their deals with i'm sure netflix would be far less incentivized to make a roku app if roku were um installing a vpn you know on their uh on their boxes there might be there might be some some things like that so yeah interesting Cool. 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 All right. Um, oh, Roger. Roger's going to make us frustrated because he's going to ask a question that is going to drive us all crazy. He says, more than once I have clicked on a video someone has sent me only to have the sound blare out of my phone, even though the ringer is all the way over to silent. This happens on my iPhone and my iPad, both using iOS 13. It always occurs at the worst possible time. How do I stop this sound override. And uh, as I said, Roger, this, this is a great question because it happens to all of us from time to time and perhaps more frequently than we would like. Um, there are no shortage of separate volume levels that iOS tracks, and not all of them are settable in advance. If you go to settings, sound and haptics in iOS 13, you can set one of them. The rest, as I'm finding, are only settable while the sound is happening. So for this, I would say the next time that you're either alone or in an environment where playing a video won't, you know, make you the uh, subject of great ridicule, uh, go play a video and then adjust the volume down there. And that should help with that one. Cause once you've done it, then you're good to go. Uh, sometimes having the mute switch enabled would eliminate it, but it doesn't always. In fact, I was, I was actually in a recording studio this weekend. I was sitting on the couch in the mixing room and while they were doing some stuff that I wasn't involved in and I was just messing around on Twitter and suddenly some video was playing at, you know, full blast out of my phone. Everybody looks at me and I was like, yep, uh, that's me. Hey, how you doing? Thanks guys. Uh, and my mute switch was on as it often is. So I, I think you just got to play them. And change it with the buttons, uh, you know, with the volume buttons while things are happening. And and this is if you use CarPlay, now you can add a whole extra list of things. Like my my music volume is settable when music is playing, but the volume of the navigation announcements is only settable when the navigation announcement is happening. So you know, while you're driving, you got to reach quick for the volume knob to set those navigation announcements where you want them to be. So yeah, it's, um, I, I, have you found any other, any other ways to, to solve this problem, John? Uh, no, I run into it every now and then with ways is that I got to turn up the volume. Yep. Cause it's, uh, too low and I want to hear it, you know, tell me what to do yeah. <laughs> or yeah. warn me of, of yeah. hazards and stuff. Sure. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's annoying. Yeah. yeah, you have all these different volume levels. I've never had a video blare out. Usually, you got to tap on it or something in order to. to this was in know, the like Instagram and YouTube. It, it'll actually say, you know, volume up or you know, activate right. If you want to hear what's happening, that's so. what I thought was going to happen. I was looking at some video or something on. I think it was on Twitter, and it just played it loud and proud. It's like, oh, cool. There's no uh, auto mute. Or default mute, I should say. Maybe there is. Maybe I got to look in the in the Twitter app. But yeah, fun. Uh, all right, Eric. He says one thing that has been driving me crazy as of late is trying to figure out errors in iOS's autocorrect feature. When I got my most recent new iPhone, for some reason the autocorrect seemed to go crazy. In particular, 
It wants to always autocorrect my last name to either a, an all caps version or one that is spelled incorrectly with like an A at the end of my last name or, you know, letters missing. As I frequently write my name, like when I'm filling out forms, this is an extremely irritating autocorrection. On my iPad, I'm more inclined to just type the first four letters of my name, then select the suggestion by hitting space rather than having to type it all out because it works elsewhere, but not on my iPhone. My muscle memory is still in place. And so I never stop making the error, which I think means I'm reinforcing autocorrects errors over and over again. Is there any way to fix this? So there, there's a couple ways uh, in terms of teaching autocorrect. The, I think the best way is maybe overriding autocorrect is a, is a better way to say it is to go to settings. This is on your iPhone settings, general keyboards, text replacement, and put your last name in twice the same way. Uh, for me, you know, I'd put Hamilton in as both the phrase and the shortcut. Now it says that the shortcut, you can just leave blank. And I think for what we're doing here, that may actually be fine. So you can just put, you know, for me, I'd put Hamilton in and that sort of is the first place that autocorrect looks is at this text replacement list. Um, it's kind of like, you know, text expander light is built into iOS. So that that might do it for you. The other thing is, and I don't know if you can do this on iOS or not, um, but it, it, I think you can, John, maybe you can help me with this is go into your contacts and make sure you set a my contact record. I think you can do it on iOS and contacts. Uh, you can certainly do it on the Mac. And then that way, the the stuff from your contact record is also sort of surfaced, especially when you're filling out forms like that. So that, that can help help with at least that part of it. Uh, but yeah, uh, put that in settings, general keyboards, text replacement would be the place I would go for that. Any uh, any thoughts or any of that, John? Huh? No, never been there. Okay. Okay. Well, you should go there. It's a handy place oh, to be. Look at that. Yeah. Text replacement. Yeah. Huh. Man. Uh, I think the default is here. OMW. <laughs> On my way. That is right. Yeah. So that's where um, I mean, I do this in text expander as well, but I like to have it sync across my devices, and I like to have it everywhere. So I'll put like. Uh, you know, for my, you know, Dave at Mac observer email address that I don't want to have to type out. I have D T M O and I put that here as well as in text expander so that it's available on every keyboard that I'm typing on, no matter where I am. And when I type D T M O it expands that to Dave at Mac observer.com, which is super handy. I do it with my phone numbers, you know, the kind of the things that I'm typing all the time. And it's so bad that when I'm filling out, you know, you, you're at like a, a restaurant that uses an iPad or, you know, whatever at their kiosk and they give you the thing and they're like, oh, do you want a receipt sent to your email? I'm like, yeah, that's fine. And I will start typing my shortcut for my email address. Now, their iPad isn't linked to my iCloud account, so it doesn't work. But, you know, I have to stop myself like, oh, right. Yeah, it's just muscle memory. So uh, Kiwi Graham is suggesting reset keyboard dictionary. Uh, on, on iOS, I don't, I, I, I mm, do you know where that is? Kiwi Graham? I would, you can reset that by going to general reset and then tap on reset keyboard dictionary. That might be a great way to do it. Thank you so much for that. Kiwi Graham. This is what I love about the chat room is you folks no, yeah. add all this stuff yeah. in for us. Yeah. Very, very cool. So. Thank you. Yeah. Good stuff. Anything more on that, John, before we, before we move on? No, we're, we're good. We're rocking. All right. Uh, Erica asks, and this might be, um, might be a challenge. I was wondering if you guys knew of an app that would help me manage my subscriptions. I have quite a few and was hoping that there's a way to remind me when a scheduled payment would be made. And then I could decide if I wanted to keep the subscription or cancel it. So off the top of my head, John, I don't know of any things like this. I mean, I, you know, you could put reminders in your calendar, right? Um, any thoughts come or to you mind? Use reminders. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Reminders in your calendar. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, I meant I meant the reminders app. Sure. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, to me, they're all the same. It's just, but, but you're right. Yes, you could use the reminders app. Um, but that doesn't allow no, you that's... to see. Like, it would be nice to have a list of your subscriptions somewhere with the the dates, and then also have that remind you, right? Like being able to to kind of view it from from any way. Like, when does that Hulu subscription renew? Did I pay for a year of something? You know, et cetera, et cetera. That would be. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I. <sighs> I mean, for, for, yeah, what I do is, yeah, that like you, I use the calendar app, you know, to remind me like when to pay a bill and stuff like that. I have a, you know, monthly reminder Yep, that comes up. Yeah. If you folks know, send us a note, feedback at MacGeekGab.com, please. We'd love to, we'd love to hear yeah. from you. I think I heard you right, Dave. Did you say feedback at MacGeekGab.com? I did. I said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Unless you're a premium sub- supporter, which is evidently easier to write than say. <laughs> uh then you can email premium at MacGeekCab.com. All right. In, uh, in the geek challenge realm, I think we have one from Jed. Uh, I have some ideas about this, but I don't, I don't, I certainly don't have an answer. So please listen closely and, and maybe you do. Hey guys, it's Jed. Uh, just calling with a question that's been picking away at my brain for a long time. So, Dave, you were mentioning in a previous episode recently, like, how, many, how much you use PDFs. And I don't use them as much as you probably, but we all have just thousands of PDFs, especially for me as tax season comes. And I was just wondering, is there a good system to organize them? I don't know how you organize them. I guess this is a question of how do you guys organize them. In a lot of ways, what I would love is something automated. Um, I don't know, you know... I remember back in the day, Yojimbo did that thing, but it actually made copies of each document, so I didn't really use it then. But I'm kind of looking for something that is basically almost an iTunes for PDFs. And I've tried different versions and different things, and I've never found one that I like. Um, in an ideal world, I think I'd love something that scanned some of the language and could, you know, almost like a Hazel for PDFs so that would scan inside the PDF language, and I don't think that is created yet. I've tried tags but I feel like I'm in 1999 where I just look at the file, put it in a folder. Sometimes I'll like, you know, yeah, that's it. I wish there was a better solution. I'm hoping you guys are going to be like, oh yeah, you should try this obvious solution that we've been using. Or if not, I'm curious how you organize your stuff. Okay. Thanks guys. Don't get caught. Thanks, Chad. And as much as we would love to have you continue to party like it's 1999, maybe we have an answer for you. I don't know. But you're not alone. I, I do like this idea of iTunes for PDFs, right? I don't know of one, uh, but it might well exist. So, again, if you folks know, let us know. Then uh, we've got some stuff appearing in the chat room, so we'll, which we'll, we'll kind of throw out here uh, in a minute. What I do to answer your question is I manually file them in folders in the finder. I know manually filing bad idea. It's rife with opportunity for, and plenty of examples of human error. Uh, I know a lot of folks, David Sparks is the first that comes to mind to employ a series of Hazel rules to automate the same end result, filing them in folders on your disc, you know, effectively viewable with the finder. And that seems way better. Um, you know, an example that that I always think of every month is when I download my monthly bank statements. You know, Hazel can grab those files based on the rules that you set up and watch your downloads folder, auto rename them and move them into your preferred folders. Uh, I have yet to employ this method, um, but I should, especially now that I've intentionally stopped getting paper statements from various banks and all that. I always tell myself, well, it's fine. They're all in my downloads folder. I don't delete them. So they're there. What could possibly go wrong? And I know as I ask that question that I, I can come up with answers for it. And the universe has some for me that I, I have yet to come up with. So, uh, so I really should employ this and maybe I will, um, you know, those are famous last words, especially at audit time when those those records might really be handy and your bank will will charge you a princely sum for older uh, statements at times. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is good stuff. So in the uh, in the chat room here, Dan C says he uses Mariner paperless. 
Okay. Uh, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. I don't know anything about that yet, but maybe I should. And, uh, and Brian Monroe says uh, notes or iBooks because notes and iBooks actually, yes, will both sync with all of your devices and will manage your PDFs. They might not organize them in the way that you would want. Um, and I think notes, I think both of these are going to make copies of it similar to what Jed was saying with Yojimbo, but the copy is not necessarily that bad, especially if you can automate some way to, you know, pitch them after a while or something like that. So, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Interesting. And the nice part is depending on how the PDF is generated, you know, if you're using, if you do kind of go the hazel finder route then spotlight can also be your friend especially if you're putting them in in folders where you can limit your spotlight searches and say okay find me the thing that you know has like a find me a credit card statement that has you know netflix on it or find me a credit card statement that has apple store or something you know something like that so that would be um, that would be interesting what do you think john i do what you do is hope and pray well no they're uh... <laughs> Well, sometimes, but, um, yeah. no, I, I, um, you know, I keep them in my documents folder and give them a meaningful name. So when I do need to find them, I can find them with the spotlight. Yeah. It Mariner paper. Oh, I call it, I don't know why I'm calling it Mariner paperless. It paperless from Mariner software looks to be this iTunes for PDFs. Uh, just, just kind of scrolling through it quickly here. I, I suppose I've heard of it in the past. I've certainly never used it or tested it, but this looks like a thing and it's got smart folders. So it shows you this week, this month, last week, last year, this year, et cetera, et cetera, uh, for receipts and statements and all of that stuff. And of course it links with, they've got a partnership with Fujitsu. So your scan snap scanner automatically can kind of pull stuff in this. Okay. So this is, this seems to be exactly what Jed was asking for is paperless from Mariner. So we'll, um, we'll definitely put that in the show notes. I mean, the other place you could look is, hmm, maybe Adobe makes something. And it looks like they do. Okay. Well, I, I was just searching. So they have something called Adobe Acrobat Reader DC, which I guess stands for Document Cloud. So. Okay. And apparently that's free. Download free Acrobat Reader DC software. The only PDF viewer that lets you read search. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Huh. So maybe that, I don't know. Yeah. I have Acrobat reader DC. I never, I mean, I think DC is the version that you like have. If you want to have Acrobat reader, at least the ver it's the version I have. Um, but you're right now it's connected to Adobe document cloud, making it easier than ever to work. I've, I've seen this screen a million times. I've never, um, I don't know. Well, wait, there's a trial of it. Why? Oh, oh, that's Acrobat Pro. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe that's the uh, thing. I don't know. Yeah. Cool. Well, if you know, let us know. That's good. That's good. Um, we have a bunch of cool stuff found to go through that I am eager to get to. Uh, John, though, first, I would love to talk about our next two sponsors, if that's okay. Fantastic. All right. Look, it's 2020, right? We know this. Have you looked at your wireless bill lately? Our next sponsor, Mint Mobile at mintmobile.com slash MGG, thinks you probably should, and I agree with them, because you're probably paying too much, right? Network coverage is better than ever now, no matter your wireless provider. So why pay more for the same service? This is where Mint Mobile comes in because they can cut your bill down to 15 bucks a month for the same premium coverage. I know what you're thinking, right? This is too good to be true, but these guys know what they're doing. We've been using Mint Mobile here for almost a year and it's fantastic. The coverage that I get, you know, I travel around. I always check my Mint Mobile coverage because, you know, I use it and it's great everywhere. It's fast. It's often faster than the provider I was using before for this stuff. Really, really fast. And here's the thing, right? Your old wireless bill pays for expensive retail stores and overhead. And that's why Mint Mobile reimagined how you buy wireless and they made it all online. And then they pass that savings directly to you. 
Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text plus crazy fast 4G LTE. You can bring your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan. Keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile's got you covered because they have a seven day money back guarantee. So to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash MGG. That's mintmobile.com slash MGG. And you can cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash mgg our thanks to mint mobile for sponsoring this episode look when websites don't load we lose interest right for each second a page takes to load it costs a company an average of 16 percent in engagement per second fewer visitors mean fewer customers that's not good for anyone and this is why cashfly has your back yeah you're right that's the same cash fly that provides the bandwidth to get the show from us to you and has for well over a decade. Well, with their new web optimization capabilities, they can take care of your stuff too. All of your content will be optimized before it's delivered to visitors without requiring any development effort from you. With the recent addition of Cashfly's flexible edge application platform and implementation services, their capabilities reach far beyond those of a traditional content delivery network, right? Cashfly's web content optimization solution includes powerful APIs that can solve all those problems for you. They can do your next gen image optimization on the fly so you don't have to worry about it. And they can even do load balancing of your application, the smart asset delivery that you've been getting with MGG for over a decade from them. Look, the good people at Cashfly are even going to provide a free optimization consultation for any listeners of this show. That's right. Just for you, Mac Geek Gab listeners. So you can know exactly where your site stands today. You can visit mac.cashfly.com. That's M-A-C dot C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Or just visit the show notes at macgeekgab.com and you can click through from there. Our thanks to Cashfly for sponsoring this episode. All right. I'll, I'll move back over here again. And uh, and I want to go to Mace because he he sent us this cool stuff found. And I bought this app immediately after seeing the examples. And the app is called Touch Retouch. Uh, he says, I hate taking photos of landmarks only for the mood to be ruined by like power lines or other not cool stuff found in the scene this app touch retouch totally solves this you choose the photo you drag your finger over the lines like the power lines and they are shopped out of the image immediately boom and he sent some examples of you know various landmarks that he has photoshopped power lines and and those sorts of things out of and I mean, I zoomed in on these things. It looked amazing. And so I quickly went and just bought the app. I think it was like $1.99 or something. So now uh, it's on my iPhone. You can also put it on your iPad. But uh, for me, I was able to put it on both. So uh, so thank you, Mace. Good stuff. Very, very cool. Yeah, John, have you messed with it yet? Have you, have you, you can look at the PDF in the, uh, no, in our, I, in our I, thing. No, I did see what, I'm I'm trying to remember where I where I saw the example. Was it on Facebook or something? Oh, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, it's so yeah. Two bucks. Totally. Uh, totally worth it. All right, Gary. Uh, sorry, not Gary. Greg. My apologies. Um, shares with us a video from Apple Insider, uh, talking about how to get wireless CarPlay in your car even if your car doesn't have wireless CarPlay. And there are two adapters that they talk about in this, that um, in this video that, that will work for this. And, and they're, they're wireless CarPlay adapters. It's, it's pretty cool. One's called CarPlay to air for 160 bucks. And uh, I have not checked it out yet, but it sure seems like this would be, the thing to check out because wouldn't it be nice to have wireless car play in your car? Just this, the, the dongle, it's a little dongle that you buy plugs into your USB port in your car, like your phone would. 
and then your phone just connects as soon as the dongle comes. I mean, you have to configure it the first time, but then as though your car itself had wireless CarPlay, now it just connects and, you know, you're good to go and you can use a, uh, a Qi charger in your car. Or if it's a quick trip, you don't have to use a charger because, and that's really to me where this comes in really handy is the ability to just get in the car and drive and CarPlay is just there. Good to go. So, um, that it's pretty cool. So we'll put a link in the uh, in the show notes to the article that has the video and the links and all of that stuff from um, from Apple Insider, and and we'll see. So there you go. Thanks, Greg. Pretty good, huh, John? Maybe maybe this year you'll get a car that has CarPlay. That would be a good thing. Uh, well, I got the. Uh, I kind of have CarPlay, but 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 I have the. Um I got the Roav Smart Charge Car Kit F2. Okay. And it's like 26 bucks. Yeah. But that but that that's doing it through uh radio. It's not really car. That's eh, kind of CarPlay ish. <laughs> well, no, I, I would say it's not CarPlay. I know what you're saying, but CarPlay once you've experienced CarPlay Oh, I know you get the UI and you get the, the UI, stuff. you get yeah. you get the screen with the apps and the buttons and the apps integrate you know, even third party apps are built to integrate with CarPlay in, in very specific ways. Yeah, it's a right. it's a it, like yeah. ways, right? Like ways is one of them for sure. You know, my Libby to do audiobooks, um, you know, Overcast is another one. Of course, Apple Maps and, and all of that stuff, too. But yeah, no, it it makes the experience in the car. It very much reduces that whole distracted driving thing that that you get even just trying to use mm -hmm. ways on your phone. Uh, I had a rental car not that long ago <laughs> that that did not have CarPlay. Actually, the one that we mm -hmm. had in in uh, it for when we were out at Max Stock, it had CarPlay, but it didn't automatically come up. I had to like dig through the the car's menus and be like, "Hey, what's this?" And then boom, there was the CarPlay screen. It was like, um, "Why didn't you come up automatically?" But um, it, but you know, it's 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 a very different experience not having CarPlay. Yeah. It's it, it's one of the best reasons to upgrade the car these days, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, if and when I upgrade my vehicle, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, have to have to make sure that it has CarPlay. Yeah, I think you, I think you'd like it. I really I, I know you're not like I, I think I think you would actually like it because of all the reasons that you don't like all the other gizmos in your car like this consolidates it all in a very, very simple, meaningful way. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think you know my feeling on the thing is, you know, the currently what I have, it's simple. There, there's not right. a lot of distractions. I'm right debating how much distractions I want in the car. Sure, <laughs> my no, next I, car. I, yeah, I know. That's what I mean about CarPlay being at probably the thing that you would like the most. I mean, you whatever mm -hmm. car you buy next, you will have a screen in it. Like, there's just no way around that. Uh, and having yeah. CarPlay integrated with that screen really cuts down on all of that because you you also get pretty good Siri integration too, uh, you know, kind of as mm -hmm. part of that. So yeah, that's yeah, pretty good. All right, uh, a couple of geeky things here and cool stuff found. The first comes from listener Alex, who tells us about something called Amethyst. Uh, it is a tiling window manager for Mac OS. So this is very much a throwback to the, you know, Unix style window manager where um, it, it really it's best. Uh, we'll just link to it and you can and you can go and, and they've got some videos about how it all works and, and all of that stuff. Uh, I'll link you to the GitHub page where you can you can see kind of how it works. But very, very cool to have keyboard shortcuts to cycle from window to window and bring focused up and, and forward, which can be really handy. Uh, like terminal has this, you can, you can cycle through windows. I think command, command tick, back tick, what does it in terminal to jump through different windows and all that. But, but this, you can, it's cool. You install it with homebrew. It, like I said, I, I told you it was geeky and I meant it, but, um, but yeah, so there you go. So thank you, Alex. Good stuff. Have you messed with, with amethyst at all, John? No, mm, you might like this. Yeah. Yeah. Look at all the shortcuts. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't know if I deserve this level of window <laughs> management. <laughs> John, you deserve it. You work hard. You deserve it, man. It's good. Um, 
And my my next addition to cool stuff found here is a new router that I've been playing with. It's from Unify or from Ubiquity. It's in their Unify product line. And it's called the Unify Dream Machine or the UDM as they call it. Now, for those of you that know about Unify either from the show or or you know on your own, Unify is it is certainly usable in the home and fantastic in the home, but it is also an infrastructure and a foundation that allows you to really do, you know, full like enterprise environments too, really, really big installations. And what's cool about it is everything's managed from one interface, uh, which is sort of what you have with your router now, but also your switches and, and you see all your clients and it's very, very configurable and, and all of the things that you would expect for an enterprise system. But, but it looks like the interface looks nice and it, it's, it's easy enough to understand that it doesn't get overly complex unless you want it to. Now, the one thing about Unify that was sort of the, the, the stumbling block, if you will, for people in their homes is that Unify is what I call or used to be what I call and it still can be an a la carte network system. So when you buy a router, really what we're saying, you know, for most routers, the airport extreme or like the one that, you know, that I like the Synology, the RT 2600 AC, but really any router that we talk about here is more than just a router. Yes, there is the router in there. There's also a wireless access point. There's also a, an ethernet switch, right? Usually. And there's also the software component that manages all three of those other things. So it's four pieces baked into one. Fine. And, and this is what most of us want. Well, with Unify, prior to the Uni Unify Dream Machine, you had to buy a router. They called it the security gateway, right? Then you'd also buy a wireless access point. And there, were, there, there are a variety of those. And then you would buy an Ethernet switch. And then you would buy a cloud key that is the local management interface that lets you use and tie all of those things together. That seems a little excessive, but when you're building for an enterprise, it makes sense to want to kind of distribute these things and maybe have them in different places and, and control them in the ways that you want. Well, the unified dream machine solves that because it ties all of that together, right? It's got the router in there. It's got the cloud controller, the cloud key in there. It's got a four port gigabit switch and it has a dual band four by four access point in there. So it's all tied together. And the CPU in this thing is much faster than the one in the, the security gateway, which would be the router component that you would buy a la carte, John. And whereas that one, if you were doing uh, in, intrusion protection or uh, detection, maximum speed you'd get was maybe two to 300 megabits per second, right? Which, which is fine unless you're on like a gigabit connection. And then that's, that's not fine. Uh, with the unified dream machine, it's got a 1.7 gigahertz quad core processor in there. I've gotten this thing over 900 megabits per second. They say 850 is what it'll do with IPS and IDS, the intrusion protection or detection. Um, I've gotten it over 900 in the tests that I've done with it. I mean, it, it, it's fast and which is great, which is what you want uh, when you're, you know, when you've got this going. So very, and it's only 299, right. To, for, for this. And, and it works as a standalone router. Like that's all you would need to buy and you're good to go. Now, if you want to add another access point, because say, you know, you would want to meshify it. No problem. You just buy a unify access point tie it all together. You've got the cloud interface, the controller that can tie these things together and manage it and all of that stuff. And you're good to go. So if you want to get into geeky, you know, I'll call it prosumer, the geeky router world, uh, the dream machine is a great point of entry. It's way less expensive. Like the other way to go, I should have added it all up, but it's, it's probably close to, you know, 450, 500 bucks to do it a la carte. And you're not getting as much as you would, uh, with the dream machine, especially in terms of the CPU and all of that. So, um, so it's a pretty cool thing. And I, of course I'll put a link in the show notes. So, um, so pretty neat, huh, John? Yeah. I like the, um, yeah, what jumped out to me was the managed 
part of the uh, of the switch because I think I've gone on about that to you. <laughs> you have yes, right. So the switch in this, the, all unified switches are managed in that you can control them and see what's happening with them and 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 all of that stuff. And yes, the four port switch that's in the Dream Machine is managed, and then the Dream Machine could manage could be the interface to manage other unify switches. And this is where um, I've been, I mentioned earlier in the show that I have my own network issue that I might talk about later. Well, it's later now. And so let's talk about this. So I have one managed switch in my home and it is an eight port unify switch that uh, they had sent me as part of a review when I first checked out, you know, all of this unify gear. And, I think, as I mentioned at the time, it's what made me see the light that you've been trying to shine in my eyes for years, John. Um, and and that is that managed switches are a good thing. Yeah. I mean, you get statistics and you can uh, <clears throat> fine tune your network if, if it's managed rather than it being unmanaged. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's one more thing, though. And this was the thing that for me really kind of sold me. Yes, I can tweak things, but I can also see what's going on on that one switch uh, because that's the only managed switch that I have. And what I can see is if there's, you know, a network loop created or things like that. And I know lots of us with older homes, like best case scenario would be to have you know, any ethernet all tying back to one central, you know, network closet or something like you would have in a, in a, you know, you know, in an office environment, maybe, and, and in a, perhaps a newer home where they're building that stuff. But what I have is I've got an older home. It's, you know, a 50 year old home certainly was not built with ethernet in the walls. And then I have my office, which is a separate building ethernet connected uh, to the house. So I have, I run five switches here. I've got a switch in the office. And then I've got a switch in the attic in the house, which is where the cables come into. It sort of distributes things. And then I have uh, on one side of the house, I have two switches. I have one in the bedroom and one kind of in the computer room, if you will, for lack of a better term. And then on the other side of the house, I have a switch by the TV. So there's five switches to manage. And I routinely run into problems where one of the switches gets confused, like the ARP routing tables in it just aren't right. And I think it has to do with there's a lot of factors. But, you know, I think the 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 Mocha connection that I have bridging two of these things together because I don't have Ethernet officially run in one place. And I think that starts to cause some weird issues. And then troubleshooting becomes a disaster for me because it's like, well, the the best thing I can do is just turn off all the switches and turn them back on. And that resets the the routing tables and the switches and things usually get better, but I never quite know. So what I really want in my home is not just managed switches, although I do. I want managed switches that are all managed from a single interface. And then Unify would definitely check that box. Now, where Unify falls a little bit short for me and why I haven't quite pulled the trigger yet on purchasing all this stuff is I would like where my cabling will support it to have my switches connected with 10 gigabit per second ethernet. And again, I, I know a lot of you folks listening are in the same scenario where you you're forced to have what I call clusters of ethernet devices. They can't all run back to one, you know, they can't all have home runs back to a network closet. So you've got these clusters and that's why I have switches in various places. I've got a cluster in the office, cluster at the TV, cluster in the computer room, cluster in the master bedroom. Right. And so that's where these things all tie together. I would love the switches themselves. Even if I'm not using any 10 gig capable devices, I would like the switches themselves to talk with each other over 10 gig so that every device on the network has lots of throughput to kind of talk back and forth with each other. And I'm not, kind of hamstrung by gigabit links between all the switches. Most of the time, to be quite honest, it doesn't matter. The gigabit links between the switches are fine, but it would be nice to know that they are. So I want single interface, which Unify does like that's the whole, that's their whole benefit. And then I also want 10 G and I know that there's some early access stuff. People are talking about with the Unify stuff that is coming or is maybe even still available with 10 G. But, um, 
But there you go. And I know Netgear. I met with them at CES, and they're doing a lot of this kind of, you know, prosumer um, single management interface for the switches. So that's what I'm really looking for is, is if, if you folks know of anything, you know, where a smart switch can be managed as a family, if you will, not just, I go to the web interface for that one. I go to the web interface for this one. I want one interface kind of like mesh versus, you know, what we call the quasi mesh. I don't want to manage each individual access point with a separate interface. I want one interface to see it all together. I'm willing to spend a little money to do this. I mean, it's to, to add five switches, you know, or add four switches to the one that I already have. It's probably cost me somewhere in the neighborhood of like 400 bucks or something like that. But, but then I can actually, when there's a problem, I can go to this one interface and see how things are tied together and where traffic is or isn't passing. And maybe the switches would just deal with it for me. You know, like that's possible that they would identify the problem and, and highlight it. But even if they don't, I can sort of dig in. So, so what, what smart switches do you use, John? And do they have this kind of interface? I have the TP link. Let me see if I can get the model here. Okay. Yeah, All right. I'll get it, get it for you. Yeah. Second. Okay. But, that's fine. But, you can no, put it in the show notes. That's fine. link. Uh, yeah. Smart switch. Yeah. I'll, okay. Uh, I'll find a link to it. Yeah. And, and is like, is there any sort of, you know, cloud? I think Netgear's interface is actually all in the cloud, uh, which, which eliminates the need for something local to be the management interface. Uh, does TP link have any sort of, you know, cloud or overreaching management interface or no? Yeah, here it is. TLSG1024DE. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll link to that. Yeah. But um, you know, it shows statistics and and you can set up a you know, bandwidth uh, limiting and and things like that if you if you want to get into that. So And they're uh, pretty inexpensive too. Okay. But but no, oh, like like every switch, you have to just go to its IP address and and manage it. There's no thing that would see correct multiples. Okay, all right, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, well, so maybe maybe TP Link's got something that's a little more, you know, universally managed, if you will. But well, I'll have to take a look. Yeah, yeah, craziness. Craziness. I need something to be able to see my network. It's just gotten to be too crazy. So I will, uh, I will look into this. I will report back. And of course, if you folks have any ideas, please, please let me know. I think we got time for a couple more tips here. Steve has, um, well, we'll let Steve or I'll read what Steve has to say about it. He says, uh, just something to tell people in case they get caught when upgrading to Catalina with regards to file sharing. I did a clean install of Catalina, then restored using migration assistant. All went fine when I discovered uh, all went well when I discovered that my documents folder wasn't browsable via file sharing, even though I was logged into my Mac using my username and password. Other folders in the home directory were accessible, just not documents. I tried resetting permissions by applying the permissions from the root home directory to all enclosed files to no avail. I then found out that my home folders, applications, desktop documents, downloads, library, movies, music, pictures, and sites were all not accessible, yet other folders like Dropbox or folders that I had previously made were. This led me to think it must be Catalina protecting its default home folders, but I couldn't see why I still couldn't access them when logged in with my username. This drove me nuts for hours until I saw a random screenshot somewhere that had SMBD in the files and folders privacy section. I figured SMBD was the app that does the SMB file sharing. Turns out I needed to toggle off, then back on file sharing. This then added SMBD to the files and folders privacy preference pane. Uh, when I migrated to Catalina via a fresh install and then used Migration Assistant, it kept the file sharing activated based on my prior preferences, but neglected to add SMBD to the privacy preferences. Other non-default folders weren't protected in the same way, which is why I must have been able to see them. 
So this is really interesting. Yeah, they, you know, Catalina's got a lot of privacy stuff, but um, if you if you go into the privacy preference pane, which is actually security and privacy, says Dave with his um, his uh, his alphabetical order here. Uh, you can look in the privacy list there, and I am not seeing SMBD in my list, so I need to go to uh sharing which is also alphabetically right next to that turn off file sharing on this computer turn it back on and now let's go look in security and privacy and smbd is there aha very very interesting that that is the case so i recommend everybody go and check this out because maybe you're gonna need it so that's very interesting. Huh? Who knew? Nice find. Was yours there, John? Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking on this machine. Yeah. SMBD is, uh, is, is in uh, the, uh, in, in the my list. list. Okay. All right. Good, 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 good. Yeah. Mine was not very interesting. Huh? Yeah. So it's in, in the list to look for is system preferences, security and privacy, privacy, Files and folders, and I'm gonna I'm gonna type this out. Uh, system preferences, security and privacy, privacy, and then files and folders. Look for SMBD there. So, wow, cool stuff, Steve. Well, not cool, but you know, um, that's a nice find. Thank you for sharing that. That's handy. Uh, very good. So yours was already there, John. Well. Your machine is new. Did you use Migration Assistant to bring stuff over to it? Uh, actually, hmm. come back, John. The microphone loves you. We like to hear you. Yeah, actually, I'm is. not seeing it on my new machine. Yeah, you need to do what we just did. Go turn off file sharing and turn it back on. Of course, you may yeah. decide you don't want file sharing on, on your laptop. That's a whole other discussion to have, but yeah very right. nice find steve thank you for sharing And actually that. the machine that i yeah the machine that i was yeah i was kind of confused here with, with my mini and then i realized why um i actually booted it uh, booted from a prior os because i want to play a game here so actually mm. i'm in 10.14 right now believe it or not that's why your sound was messed up when we first um started the show and that's why right, everything wanted I'm, to I'm, update because you hadn't run yeah this i wanted to uh yeah i wanted to play a play a game that uh doesn't work anymore on a on 10.15 oh well then you should just install create a uh parallels yeah ins- yeah i'm gonna yeah with mojave video. yeah 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 mm-hmm. Cool. All right. I think we got time for one last little thing. And thank you, uh, Mike, for for sharing this. Mike says, when at home, I have Wi-Fi calling turned on on my iPhone 7 running iOS 13. He says, I'm traveling in Europe and I don't need to purchase a SIM while I'm there. I have turned cellular data off. I don't want any chance of roaming charges. I forgot Wi-Fi calling was on and received a phone call from Canada yesterday. I've researched my question and have not been able to find an answer. However, further research, Mike says, it turns out that phone calls um, that come in while you are traveling, even if you're only using Wi-Fi calling, incur roaming charges. He says um, he looked on... uh, uh, he says he's with Virgin in Canada is his provider. So you need to check with your provider, but he had previously called his provider to check and they, and you know, said, no, no roaming charges. Well, they put him on his bill. So maybe because he made that phone call in advance, he can call them and get this, but, but beware. Uh, it's and from the, the checking we've done, it seems like Virgin in Canada is not the only one. So if you know about this with your provider, please let us know. But it seems like Wi-Fi calling also incurs roaming charges based on the location that you are in when you make the call, regardless of whether you're making it over Wi-Fi calling or if you're making it over cellular. So thank you for that, Mike. And uh, yeah, that's great. That's great. 
All right. Yes. Thank sneaky. you very much. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Sneaky. Well, that's, um, I think we got to, uh, I think that's all we got today, John. It's time to bring the band in out of the cold. They're freezing out there. It's like 14 degrees outside. Windy and icy. Yeah. My driveway is just like, is, is, is a, it's just covered in shards of icicles that have been blown off the trees. Yeah. Like that windstorm we got the other night that knocked everything down, knocked all the wind, all all the icicles off of the, uh, off the trees. And of course, when they crash to the ground, they, you know, sprinkle and, and splinter and break. So yeah, man, it's crazy out there. Crazy. My driveway is a death trap. If you're coming to my house, you don't walk in the driveway. That's what my attorney tells me to tell you all. Don't, I'll bring don't. my uh, flamethrower. Yeah, that's that's the idea. The flamethrower would fix it. Somebody tried to do that. The town said no. Can't imagine why. Hey, thanks for listening, folks. We uh, we do appreciate everything. We appreciate all your questions, your tips. If you're a premium supporter, we appreciate your premium support. Uh, subscribe to that newsletter. Go to MacGeekGab.com. Put your email address in. Now that we're paying MailChimp, now we really want you to subscribe. And we've always wanted you to subscribe. But now that we know why it stopped sending, we really want you to subscribe. So, yeah, good, good stuff. We, um, yeah, yeah, that's it. Just subscribe to the newsletter. That's that's what we want from you this week. That's That's all we have. And uh, and go click on our sponsors links and learn about them. You, you know, that's the deal, right? We are paid to make you aware of them and hopefully drive you to choose to learn more. Whether or not you purchase anything from our sponsors, that's between you and them. Right. That's which is totally fine. But but it really does help us if, if you just take a minute and go and visit them. And of course, we put those links in the show notes, which you can get delivered to your email box so you don't forget. And then that way you can help us and it's great. But yeah, go, you know, visit. And if, if, if of course, it's something that you're interested in, then, uh, you know, then by all means, please purchase. Like, that's great. Uh, but uh, but our job is to get you there. And, and then from there, it's, it's uh, between you and them. And we appreciate all of you. I know a lot of you do this and it really, really does help. So thank you. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks to our sponsors. I'll mention them again. ExpressVPN.com slash MGG. Linode.com slash MGG. MintMobile.com slash MGG. And Mac.CashFly.com. Of course, our ongoing sponsors. Eero.com slash MGG. Barebones.com. SmileSoftware.com slash podcast. Otherworld Computing at MacSales.com. It's great. It's good. We love it. It's great. Keep listening. Tell a friend about the show if you would. Just one of you. Well, no, I mean, each of you tell one friend. That'd be awesome. Love it. And then come back next week. We'll see you there. We'll see you here. John, Mm -hmm. do you have anything to share with him before we leave? Uh, Yeah, I it's a secret, though, but <clears throat> some advice that we have for everyone, if you're listening and listen closely, is don't get caught. Made up.